Well, good evening, Mr. and uh, thank you again for coming and talking to us this evening. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm doing a little investigating prior to the conversation with you tonight, and it turns out that you are the first female contract presenter in the book. That is kind of amazing, but... Uh, I was so surprised, and I thought it was even thought it was actually the bad side, but someone likes to know about it. Um, but in the reality, um, we have lots of female members within our club, yeah, that's right. and all sorts of age ranges as well. The other group normally have a teacher, and there are many more. Um, so we certainly have a great time to talk to them. So anyway, thanks very much for coming. So, um, it raises the question, though, about uh, the gender bias in science. You know, when I went to school, science was very much a male field, um, and that has changed over time. So, I wonder, you see the university and the classes today, how mixed are they? Um, it's better than it used to be. It depends a little bit on the field. Um, in physics as a whole, yeah, it varies, but the numbers are small. So obviously they fluctuate quite a bit. It's probably around, I'm guessing, 25-30% women, something like that. Um, in the astronomy specialization, it actually tends to be somewhat higher. Also, this is also true in graduate school. There tend to be more female astronomy grad students than, than straight physics, actually. Um, whether that's because they're particular interest in astronomy or because the culture is a little bit different, I'm not quite sure. Um, Oh, that's yeah. So it's a positive uh, it's, trend, the research. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. So, moving on. Um, you're certainly making an impact in your field. Um, what is the presentation that we saw tonight? Uh, a lot of people will be looking at that work and uh, building on that and learning from that. So, congratulations on what you achieved so far. Um, it's complicated stuff. Um, but what was it that drew you into exploring courses in the first place? Um, well, I mean, I did my undergraduate degree in physics, and I actually started working on pulsars when I got to graduate school. Um, I had heard an interesting talk uh, on pulsars sometime in my last year as an undergrad, and thought, oh, well, I'll keep this in mind. And one of the uh, graduate schools I looked at when I was trying to figure out where to go had a group that specialized in them, and it just, it just sort of stuck with me. Um, I think because you can use one set of observations to actually cover a huge range of physics. You can look at the interior of neutron stars, you can study our galaxy, you can do tests of general relativity, you can really address a whole range of different and quite fundamental physical questions, and I thought that was really appealing. Well, my history tells me that Pulsar was first discovered by a woman. Yes, yeah, a graduate student. Yeah. Who didn't get it. She didn't that. get the Nobel Prize, no. She's actually very, very gracious about that, uh, if you ever hear her talk about it. Um, no, I just didn't yeah, make so sure that it was... I think there were some cultural issues at play there. It was the yeah. mid-70s, after all. Um, she certainly did a lot of work, and many of us think that she yeah. should have shared in that prize. Yeah. But uh, that's the way it worked out at the time, I guess. But, um, no, she yeah. is the one who, who identified that the source was uh, physical and uh, put in the effort to, to chase it down. And, yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is a very difficult uh, task to ask you to do. But, you know, so, what exactly is a pulsar for the people who are looking at this website? Yeah. Um, so it's already off. And why is it so important? Well, so a pulsar is the uh, one of the things that's left over after a supernova explosion. So, when a star that's eight or more times the mass of our sun undergoes a supernova, it blows most of its remaining envelope out into the interstellar medium. And the remaining, say, one and a half solar masses of matter right down the center contracts down. And eventually, just about all the protons and electrons merge together to form neutrons. And you end up with one big kind of nucleus, um, but not almost entirely composed of neutrons, um, in a very, very small volume um, with a density that is probably 10 times higher than the density of that nucleus. So uh, one of the slides that I gave to you gave the numbers, one and a half times the mass of our sun squashed down to about the size of a city, 10 kilometers or so in radius, um, with a magnetic field sort of a trillion times that of the Earth, 
and spinning you know, up to many hundreds of times per second. Uh, so it's a truly extreme environment. And um, as I was saying a bit earlier, they actually, even though we don't fully understand how they work, they provide these uh, great tools through regular timing of their pulses, which are sort of made by kind of a lighthouse-like beam, uh, to let us probe this huge range of different physical questions. And so that's why they're important, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. South of Manchester, actually, but yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Manchester University was the, yeah, the, the owner of the telescope. The owner of the telescope. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in the UK, we talk from Amazon, yeah. and he was one of the other jobs. Yes, it's sort of this an icon the there. Era of Sputnik. Yes. Yes. That was one of the places, one of the few places I met. It was a track of yeah. life, all sorts of things at the time. Um, did you ever meet the, uh, the founder of that observatory, Bernard Lumpy? I certainly ran into him a few times. I'm not sure he would know who I was <laughs> pretty fast, but uh, he was certainly around a lot while I was there. He came into the office pretty much every day and wrote a colloquium. It's a name if you would have mentioned that to people, sort of my age, or, or, or younger, um, from the UK, they would know who he was. Yes. Both yes. Lovell yeah. and Patrick Moore were the two icons in the astronomy for, for different reasons. And, but in both cases, popularization, whenever yes. there was a, a scientific explanation, it was likely Lovell yeah. you know, that would be brought in to, 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 to be interviewed. And, uh, yeah. He even inspired in me, when he invested in the world, a, a small yardy uh, array okay. um, on the back of my, on the top of my father's garage, which I controlled with a book to change the atmosphere. Sorry, the other bitch. Um, um, I gave up that. I gave back to the strong Um so, the closing question which came from one of the members yeah. of our club. Yeah, right. You lived in Manchester uh, for a couple of years, so did you ever decide which team care you care support? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, I think I pay more attention to the Habs than either of the soccer teams, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.